All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the EX 494 Legend of Zelda template tutorial. It's going to be a great time. The purpose of this tutorial, and you can go and open up Unity, uh, is to kind of get you started with the Legend of Zelda for Project 1, okay? So go ahead and open up the template project, and uh, we are going to see what we got. So cool. You'll see that you have a bunch of stuff in your asset folder, your kind of project pane, uh, to start off. That's what the template gives you. You'll see that you have a few scenes. Go ahead and open up the scene folder, and we're going to want the dungeon scene. Okay, That's where most of the gameplay is going to be built by us. So go ahead and you double click it, and you're there, as you can see in the top bar. However, there appears to be nothing in the scene, and that's kind of weird, isn't it? You can look around, there's nothing there. But if you look at the main camera, there's something special on it. There's a secret component, a new component, that's called the show map on camera component, okay? This was built by Jeremy to help us uh, more easily create the environments from these classic games. Uh, basically, you give it an image, and this component parses it, and then creates a few different uh, data structures uh, to make it really quick and easy to recreate the levels. Let's play the game and see how it works. Hey, cool, we've got the first dungeon from Legend of Zelda. Great stuff, right? If you go into the scene view, we can uh, get a, a better clue of what's going on. So you can see that only a portion of the Legend of Zelda map is being drawn. However, if we move the main camera around by highlighting it in our hierarchy, and then editing its transform values, that's the transform component, you can see that this interesting new component, the show map on camera component, draws different tiles of the map based on where the camera is. This is really cool because, for instance, if you look at all of the tiles that are in existence under the map anchor parent, you can see that there are a bunch of tiles. But this is still far fewer than if we were, you know, drawing all the tiles at once. Okay? So it's a good thing that we're only drawing this small amount of tiles. That way we can pretty much be sure the game won't lag and stuff like that. It's just efficient. So what we should probably do is we should probably get our hero in there. If there's anything the game is missing right now, it's a protagonist. So let's go ahead and look into the resources folder. Maybe the prefabs folder, misc folder, or forget all that. And just look at the link sprites um, sprite. Now this sprite is made of a bunch of different images. If you click on the Link Sprites image, you can see that, wow, it's actually a PNG that's full of a bunch of different tiny sub-images. This is called a sprite sheet, okay? And basically what happens is you get an image and you go up and you set its texture type to be a sprite. And then you can either have a sprite that's a single sprite or a bunch of sub-sprites. And that's what we want. We want multiple sub-sprites. You can even see how things are chopped up if you go into Sprite Editor. You can see these little boxes that create all the different sub-images. And you can even edit them by pulling these different knobs. So, because we have all these miniature sprites inside this one image, we can open that image up like a folder, and we can go through all of these different images, all the sub-images. So that's great. So go ahead and grab one of these and drag it into your hierarchy or into your scene anywhere you want, okay? Hey, there's Link. Let's go ahead and rename our object Link. Cool. Let's try and play the game. Hey, well there's Link, at least half of him, right? Something must be going wrong. If we switch to the scene view, maybe we can diagnose what it is. If you switch to the scene view, you can see that, hey, our link, it appears to be behind the you know other graphics for the room. That's not good. That's not what we're after. So if we go into the link objects sprite render component, which is where we would probably look since this is a rendering problem, what we can do is we can play around with a few things. Order and layer looks a little bit promising. Hey, if you move it up, then all of a sudden Link is being drawn um, last, right? And so it's on top. So this order and layer property can be used 
to put things, uh, arrange things on top of each other or behind each other. So because link is pretty much always going to be, you know, visible on screen, we're going to set it to one. Now remember, if you turn the game off, if you unpress the start button, then all everything's going to be reset. That one is going to turn back into zero, and we're back at our problem. So make sure you reapply your settings after the game has finished, okay? Great. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? Let's shift Link down a little bit so that he's in a, a bit of a more natural starting spot. That's pretty good. Let's leave him there. So we have the player avatar, Link, here, but he doesn't really do anything. He's kind of a dunce, right? We need to give him the ability to interact with the environment. The first way we can do that is by giving him a little bit of physics. So when we want to give behavior to um, an object in Unity, we always give it a component. We introduce a component. So go to your link object, do add component, and give it a rigid body, OK? Rigid bodies are components that physically enable their object, OK? So you can see that link now has gravity. It has mass, it has drag and angular drag. So let's go ahead and click and see what happens. Link falls straight off the map, okay? Because our use gravity is set. Now, this is really a top-down perspective in The Legend of Zelda, so we don't need gravity. So cool. Well, we still can't control Link, but now he has a concept of velocity, okay? So we need to add a new component, okay? Let's call it player control. Go ahead and open up the component and we'll add some logic. Cool. We have our basic component set up right now. So every frame, if we want to control link, we need to query uh, the state of our input device. Now our input device is going to be the keyboard. We'll keep it simple. So what we need to do is we need to do um, input dot get axis and which axis do we need to get? We need to get the horizontal axis and the vertical one. But for right now, let's just check and make sure that our horizontal axis is doing what we want. We want to print this to make sure it's working. So go ahead and create a print statement. Now in the console, it should tell us what the value of our horizontal axis is. You can see that it's zero currently. However, if you hold the right arrow key, it shifts to one. If you release it, back to zero. The left arrow key sends it to negative one, and if you release it, back to zero. Now this is actually a problem for us, because if you play the original Legend of Zelda, you'll notice that Link has no acceleration. He's either walking at full speed, or not at all. And you can see that when you hold the right arrow key, it takes a few frames for the game to begin printing one, okay? We need to fix that. So, go into Edit, go into Project Settings, and Input. This looks promising. Look at Axes. This is a list of all the axes available to us. And wouldn't you know it, Horizontal is one of them. You can query any of these axes. And I think you might be able to make new ones. I'm not sure. Actually, yes, you can by just altering this 18 to a 19 or whatever. So if you look in the horizontal axis, it's got a name, it's got a bunch of properties. Um, two of the things that it has is sensitivity and gravity, okay? Let's look at what sensitivity means. Speed to move towards target value for digital devices in units per second. That sounds about right. When we press the right arrow key, we want to get from 0 to 1 as quickly as possible. And by increasing our sensitivity, we can make that happen. So let's just make it a super big number. And it's good enough. If you look at gravity, it's the opposite. Speed that the output value falls toward neutral when the device is at rest. So we need this to be large too, so that when we let go uh, of the right arrow key, we instantly jump back to zero. Let's test this to make sure that it's going properly. Excellent. Hold the right arrow key down, it goes straight to 1, release it, it goes straight back to 0, nothing in between. That's perfect. We should do the same for the vertical axis while we're here. Go ahead and make sensitivity really big. 
go ahead and make gravity really big. Cool. So now that we've got the horizontal and vertical axes uh, configured the way we want, we need to actually store and use their value. So go ahead and store their value. Great. So now what we need to do is we need to actually use this horizontal input and vertical input value to affect the velocity of link. Okay? So we need to get access to that rigid body because the rigid body is what gives us access to all the physical uh, properties of the object. So you can do a get component rigid body dot velocity equals new vector 3 horizontal input vertical input and zero. That zero is because we don't really need Link to ever move in the Z axis, you know, into and out of the screen. It's simply not useful in The Legend of Zelda. So now, let's see what happens. Hey, cool. So Link is mobile now. That is a great first step toward being a hero. But he's moving really slowly, right? If you've played the game, you know Link moves a little bit faster than this. So let's introduce something. Let's introduce a public variable that's going to allow us to alter the speed at runtime. Go public float um, walking velocity equals to 1.0f, okay? And go ahead and you're going to multiply our vector three uh, times this walking velocity. We get no errors and we go ahead and make it run. Now we're still the same speed but if you go over to the link object you'll see that within our player control component we have that new property. Let's make it into a four and see what happens. Great this is quite a bit faster and this is a little bit more what we'd expect to link to walk at. So we're going to turn the game off and we're going to reestablish our configuration. Set it to four. Awesome. Link can now move. But there's something off, right? Link can move on a diagonal. Well, that's not, not all that great. That's not what we're after. So we can go ahead and do something here. We can say that if horizontal input is not equal to 0.0, .0 then vertical input is equal to 0.0. .0. Basically what this does is it uh, prevents Link from walking vertically when he's walking horizontally as well. And this will help us make sure that he walks up and down and never on an angle. There you go. Good stuff. So now we've got Link and he is mobile in a uh, in his little dungeon. But the dungeon is not that interesting. This world is not full of things that he can interact with. So let's go ahead and let's create a rupee that Link can collect. So go ahead and find the rupee sprite sheet here, or the, the little sprite. And you can see that's already marked as a sprite, and it's just a single sprite, so it's all good to go. Go ahead and drag it uh, right onto the hierarchy and we can see that it is now in our scene. We'll want to move it over toward Link though. Whee. Excellent. And make sure that it appears above all the tiles by giving it a one in the order and layer um, property. So cool, there's our rupee, but we aren't able to collide with it. So we need to fix that somehow. So let's go into our player control um, file, our component, and we're going to add a new collision based function, okay? We're going to call it void on trigger enter, okay? And it's going to be given a collision uh, parameter called. 
Now what onTrigger enter is going to do is that if link ever runs into an object that's marked as a trigger, then this function will get called. And how will we know what object we bumped into? Well, the call parameter is going to contain all of that information. In fact, why don't we test that by printing out information uh, from call? So we're going to print call.gameObject.name, OK? In this way, if link runs into a trigger, bumps into a trigger, um, then we're going to print out the name of that trigger, OK? So we would expect that our rupee would cause that function to be called and print its name rupee, right? But unfortunately, that won't happen because uh, the rupee does not have a collider. And we actually have an error. Let's find out what it is. It has to be of type collider. So let's make it collider. There you go. Unity kindly tells us when we've given it the wrong parameter. Cool. So now we need to give our rupee a collider object so that Unity will actually keep track of its bounds and let us know uh, if it collides with anything. So go into physics and give it a box collider. Okay. As soon as we give it the box collider, we can see this green box be drawn, and that is the collider. If we make it smaller, we can see it shrink and grow. Okay. And we need to mark the collider as a trigger. Okay. The difference between a trigger and a non-trigger is that if this box collider is not a trigger, uh, then Link will bounce against it and not be able to walk through it when, with his rigid body. Um, if it is a trigger, he can still walk through it, um, and that function will still be called. So we need to give Link a box collider as well. He has a rigid body, but right now that rigid body has no idea how big Link is. This box collider will help it know. So give it a box collider, and we can see that, hey, it's about the right size. Now for Link, the box collider actually should be toward his feet, okay? If you play The Legend of Zelda, you'll notice that Link can actually put his face, the face part of his sprite, um, over some blocks in the environment. And that helps it give a kind of, um, kind of 45 degree angle kind of feel. It's not utterly top down. Which makes sense, because this sprite is not utterly top down. Otherwise, we would just see the top of his head. Cool. So let's see what happens when we try and grab that rupee. Hey, we're getting exactly what we want, right? Whenever Link touches that rupee, we are um, generating that, uh, you know, calling that function and, and uh, printing out the name of the, the object. So cool. That's fantastic. But what we really want to do is we want to look like we've collected it. So we're going to go ahead and destroy the object that we um, collided with. Now, this is a little bit irresponsible, because imagine if there are other triggers in our game. Maybe we don't want to destroy them. So what we need to do is we need a way of checking whether this is, in fact, a rupee. Okay. One easy way to do that is to use the tag system. If you go um, back to Unity and all these crazy errors, I think you can ignore them. And we tag the rupee with a new rupee tag. Then we should be able to detect and make decisions um, based on what kind of object this is. So create the rupee tag and then go back to the rupee object and make sure you link up the object with the tag we just created. Okay? Now what we can do is we can go if call.gameObject.tag is equal to rupee, then we will destroy it. Otherwise, we don't want to destroy it. Let's just make sure this works. And it is definitely not working. So let's go ahead and find out what's happening. If you look at rupee object, you can see that it is tagged rupee. And if we look at our code, we can see that we're not being case sensitive. Okay? The rupee tag that this rupee object has has a capital R, and we need to respect that in our code. So let's try again and see if we win this time. 
hey, there you go. Mission accomplished. We can now run into the rupee, but we're not really collecting it, you see. So let's add a new uh, public variable. Let's call it um, rupee count, and we'll start it at zero. Now, when we collect the rupee, not only do we need to destroy the rupee, but we need to keep track of uh, the rupee count. We need to update it. So go ahead and increment the rupee count. You can also imagine that if there were other items, like hearts, that we wanted to collect, you could do some other stuff, like coal game object dot tag equals heart, and stuff like that. And then do whatever you'd like. Increment your health, um, and stuff like that. Let us make sure that the rupee count actually increments. You can see rupee count is right here, visible from the inspector, and it increments. That's excellent. However, the player, when they play the game, is not going to be able to see rupee count. So we need some UI that's going to help us um, show that information off to the player. Okay? So we're going to create a really simple UI next. All right, so let's go ahead and create some UI. So if we go ahead and play the game and think about what we want to do, this screen looks a little bit awkward right now. It's using the right perspective, the, the right ratio, 256 by 240. However, we can see the upper part of this next room, which isn't good. That's not what we're after. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and create some UI to cover that. All right? So go ahead and go to Create in your hierarchy. Go to UI and then go to Panel, all right? If you think about what The Legend of Zelda's UI looks like, uh, it's basically a black panel with a bunch of different images and texts on it. So, create this panel. We can see it right here. So, uh, if you look first at how we're kind of anchoring our panel, look into its uh, rec transform component, you can see this little box here that says stretch on the x-axis and stretch on the, the vertical axis. So click on it. We have a bunch of different options. So you look through this and you'll realize that, you know what, we really want to stretch horizontally, but we don't want to, we want to kind of be anchored to the top. We don't want to stretch vertically. So this is the button we're looking for, okay? Stretch horizontally, but be anchored toward the top of the screen vertically, okay? So that's great. And if you alter the height property, you can see that, well, it's getting thinner, right? And that's kind of what we want. If we get the uh, position dot y or position y property to zero, we can see it moves up to roughly kind of where we want. However, there we've got this portion of the panel hanging over the top that looks a little bit weird. So go ahead and edit the pivot, um, make it one, right, and then set that to zero, and we can see hey, it fits perfectly. Excellent. Let's alter the color down here. Go down to our image component, and we're going to make it um, fully opaque. And then we're going to alter the color to be black. Awesome. Let's see how this looks. Hey, we're getting there. It's a little bit too big, and you can see that because of the rounded shape of the panel, um, it is a little bit, we can see around the corners and around the sides of the, the panel. So that's not good, but we can fix that. So go back to the panel and make it a little bit smaller. Eh, why not try 70? Maybe that'll be nice. Now, we need to get rid of the kind of visibility on the sides. So we're going to shift the panel over slightly, all right? So let's give it a negative five so it hangs a little bit off the left side of the, the um, camera view. We're also going to give it a uh, negative 5 for right, so it hangs off a little bit on that side. And then to fix up the top, we're going to move it up a tiny bit by giving it a 5. Cool, so let's try it again and see how it looks. That looks a lot better. Nice. But now we actually have to add information to it. Well, one thing that we can add, one piece of information that's available to us, is the number of rupees that Lynx has. So, Let's go ahead and let's create another piece of UI 
except instead of a panel this time, we're going to create a piece of text. Great, so we've got this text. And we can tell there's going to be problems already because we can't put a black piece of text over a black background. It won't work very well. So go ahead and make that white. And then, do we have any other fonts? We're stuck with Arial for now. But you can go grab an 8-bit font from, from something else. Uh, 1001 free fonts or something like that. So just go ahead and put this guy up here, right? Looks decent. And you're going to want to think about how you want to anchor this piece of text, okay? So uh, we are going to want to anchor it toward the top of the screen. And let's just leave it in the middle for now. You guys can move it around and, and shift it and get it right. Uh, though it's not all that important. So cool, you can line things up a little bit. And this gives us plenty of room to expand the score as it grows, the number of rupees. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And you might do something like that. Great. Now we actually have to update it. It looks good, but when we go ahead and grab the rupee, it's not actually displaying the new information that we have, the fact that Link has one rupee. So what we can do is we can give a component to the um, canvas that will basically allow it to have the functionality of a heads-up display. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and create a new component. We're going to call it HUD, all right, for heads up display. So what we want to do is we need to get the information from link, okay? Once we have the, the number of player rupees, we can go ahead and update our um, our text label. So what we need to do is we actually need to have a reference to the text label because right now in this script we don't have a whole lot. So go ahead and create a new public member variable. Public text and you'll notice that text isn't actually a type available to us. In order to enable a bunch of UI stuff, we need to import unityengine.ui. Great, so now text is actually a type that's available to us. So now we can grab a reference, create a reference to Rupee text. And we need to set that reference up, okay? Let's go ahead and name our text, organize a little bit rupee text. Then if you go to canvas, you'll see that we have that new public variable available to us in our inspector. So now we can just simply grab the rupee text, drag it over, and now our HUD script has a reference to that rupee text. Fantastic. So now we can go rupee text dot text equals num player rupees dot two string. Of course we want to decorate it a little. So we'll put in here And then, just to make sure that it's updating, we will increment Ah, oh, fuck it. We're just going to leave it at negative one. Alright. So, play it now and make sure that it's working. Excellent. So it's actually displaying what we wanted to do display. Um, so we have that reference and it's working properly. However, we only have that you know negative one. We want the real value, uh, which is within the um, player control object. So how can we get that? We need to add something to the player control script. Okay. So go ahead and go back into the player control script. We need to be able to get this rupee count on the player from our HUD.cs component, okay? So one way to do that is to use the singleton pattern, okay? Because there's only going to be one player, and we know that ahead of time, 
we shouldn't feel too guilty on making that player accessible from the entire code base. Okay? The player holds lots of information that's going to be helpful all around your code base. So what we can do is we can go public player control instance and then in our start function we can go instance equals this. To provide a little bit more protection we can make sure that the instance value hasn't been filled yet. So if instance is not equal to null debug, debug error. multiple link objects detected. Now if you guys do something original with your original level where you want to have multiple links, you'll need to reevaluate the singleton pattern. Maybe you'll want to have an array of links. And then in the start function for every link, you would have some logic that registers uh, that instance of link into an array. So that way a bunch of different link objects are available all around the code base. But for now, this will do us well. Because we've done this, we can now, um, oh, we need to make this static, by the way. Public static player control instance. Uh, that completes the singleton pattern. So now we can do player control dot instance, and then that gives us a reference to that link object, which also gives us a reference to the rupee count. Excellent. So, this should be uh, exactly what we want it to be. Great. When we collect the rupee, the HUD script is able to detect that we've updated and update the UI to reflect what we want it to, to reflect. So, excellent. We've got a basic UI functionality going. So, in the future, you'll probably add stuff like hearts and health and stuff like that. It can remain this simple, okay? Uh, you will need to implement some menu and UI stuff so that uh, we can select different items and weapons and stuff like that, but it doesn't have to look authentic. The UI just has to be functional, not authentic. So our game is beginning to shape up. If you play the game, you'll notice there's been a problem that we've had for a while though. Link can slide right through what should be physical objects, physical tiles. He can go through the dragon statues, and he can also go on the wall, through the locked door. That's not what we want. We want there to be some physics, some collisions between Link and those particular tiles. If you go into your scene view, and you investigate these tiles, for example, this dragon one right here, you'll notice that all of these tiles have a box collider on them already. That's just how the tile prefab is set up. If we were to check this box collider on them, we now have a box collider on this tile. And if we play the game, we can see that Link can now collide. That's what we want, but we want to make sure that we only turn the box collider on for tiles that look solid and not tiles such as this floor tile right here. That's not good. So how can we tell the game that certain tiles deserve a collision while other tiles deserve to be just walked over with no collisions? Well, if you look at the main camera, there's something fishy about the show map on camera script. Not only is there a public member for the map sprites, which basically are a bunch of um, tiles, uh, basically a, an image with all the tiles in it. But there's also a few more text files as public member variables as well. Collision and destruction. If you click on collision, you'll notice that, hey, there are 16 by 16 underscore characters. And if you look back at the map sprites image, if you count them up, you'll see that there are 16 by 16 tiles. So this is actually a mapping. The text file tells the system which of these individual um, tiles are collidable or not. In fact, if you go into the tile script 
which is a component that every single tile has, see? Then maybe we can learn a bit more. If you go to the bottom and go into the set collider function, then you'll notice that it looks through all of those characters in that file, and in particular, it does a switch statement on them. It looks for an S, an S for solid. And then it does stuff with the box collider. The box collider is enabled by default. However, if it doesn't find an S, um, then it gets down to this default clause and it turns the box collider off. In other words, by putting different cases in here for different letters, we're able to customize the properties of the tile. So what we should do is we should go back to that file and we should put S's uh, in any place where a solid tile is. So we can do that but I kind of went and did it for you. Yay. So this is a pretty good pattern that makes the tiles basically solid when they should be and non-solid when they shouldn't be. Let's play the game and make sure it's working. All right, I can walk over these tiles, good. And I can bump into these dragon tiles. I can't go through that door but I can get through this open door until I hit the wall tile on the other side. Excellent. Now if you run around and bump around enough, you'll notice something's a little bit wonky. Link is colliding in ways we don't expect. This might seem puzzling, but if you consider the Unity environment as a 3D space, it kind of makes sense. Link is just a 2D object. Um, but it doesn't mean he, he doesn't have a 3D representation. Here you can see that by bumping into things, he's actually rolled over and flattened. Now we can get him back by playing around with the rotation. There we go. Almost good as new. We need to alter the rigid body on Link to make sure that he cannot rotate um, in... Uh, well, he shouldn't be able to rotate at all in the X, Y, or Z direction. So we can fix this by going into Link's rigid body, going into constraints, and looking at this freeze rotation field. Now we can go ahead and freeze his rotation on the X, Y, and Z axes. While we're at it, we can also freeze his position along the Z axis, since we really don't want Link going into or out of the screen. But he needs to be able to move horizontally on the X axis, and vertically on the y-axis. Let's see if this fixes it. Good. Now you can bump around as much as you'd like. You can even see that Link can hang his head a little bit over this statue. Right? Because it's not a purely top-down view. And our box collider is only at his feet. In The Legend of Zelda, tiles aren't just solid or not solid. Some tiles have special properties, such as being movable. How do you implement such a thing, though? Well, you could potentially go into your tile script, your tile component, and you could add an additional case. For example, maybe we have a new case, P. And maybe it alters itself to be pushable. You'll need to think about how you would make such an object pushable, but adding additional cases like this is how you'd go about creating new different kinds of tiles. After creating a new case, you could then go back into that collision script, and you could put a P somewhere. And that would cause that particular tile to gain the properties that you would put into that case in the script. Our game is really starting to shape up, but it still doesn't really look the part. Link doesn't animate or do anything like that at all. So, 
we need to fix that. And in fact, I have. I uh, am not going to show you exactly how it was done, step by step. It's a little bit too much code. It would take a lot of time. However, the starter code is going to come with this, and you'll simply have to hook it up. I'll show you how I changed the code from my last version to make this animate with the new state machine tools. So you'll notice that in your assets, there's a script called state machine. When you look at the classes within state machine, you'll find some things that make sense. You've got a state machine class, you've got a state class, and then you've got a weird state idle with sprite class that derives from state. And you've got another state play animation for held key that derives from state as well. These are two custom states I've built for you simply to allow you to animate without having to use the animator that comes packaged with Unity. The animator that comes with Unity is a bit fussy, and frankly, this state machine architecture will be really, really useful for things other than animation. For example, enemy behaviors, and um, AI trees, and stuff like that. So I'll show you how we've gone about creating this little animation using these states. If you go to player control, I've added a few lines of code. Namely, I've added some storage, some public member variables for holding down our animation sheets. The animation for link run downward is two frames. The animation for link run up is two frames as well, so on and so forth. I've hooked these up by going to the link object, going to the player control script, and then looking at these member variables, setting the number variables within them to two, and then by hooking up the relevant sprites. The next thing I've added to the code is an actual state machine that we call the animation state machine. It handles just animation stuff for now. In our start function, we have to actually create the state machine. Just do new state machine. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call change state on our state machine. Now, what do we change state with? We give it a new state, a new state to change to. Well, if we're going to give it a new state to change to, we have to think about, well, what is this new state? This state idle with sprite. Well, it sounds like it's just a state that puts Link into an idle animation with one sprite. And in fact, if we look into the state machine script, we'll find that's what it does. Here's our state idle with sprite state. It takes a reference to the player controller, it takes a renderer, and it takes that sprite, that sprite that we want to idle with. It simply stores all of these values, and then when the state begins, when it is transitioned to, it grabs the renderer we gave it and says that, hey, render, your new sprite is the sprite that we stored and gave to the state. In the onUpdate function, which is called every frame for the state, well, whenever the state is active, we are going to check if the user is pressing any of these arrow keys. If input.getKeyDown, the down arrow, then we're going to start walking. We're going to do state machine.change state. We're changing away from this idle state into an play animation for held key state. And what animation are we going to play? We're going to play link run down. Remember, the PC is a reference to our player controller so that we can actually grab that link run down um, sprite array. That is our animation. The six controls the speed at which we go through the animation. And this key code dot down arrow is telling the state um, which key this animation is associated with. Remember, it's the state play animation for held key state. So 
if this key is no longer held down, we want to get out of the state and go back to idle. And this is the key that we care about. If down arrow is not being held down during this play animation for held key state, then we return to the idle state. And we jump to the proper animation state depending on which arrow key we held down. Up, right, left, down, whatever we do. If we go to this other state, we'll see that, hey, it derives from state as well, state play animation for held key. It needs a few more things. It grabs a reference to the player controller, like the other state, and the renderer. It also grabs that key that we care about, and it stores some other stuff. So, we give it the animation, we give it the FPS, we give it the key, it stores all of it. And then what it's going to do is while you are holding down the key that you gave to the state, it is going to continue to play this animation. It's going to iterate through the animation by adjusting the current frame and its index based on time since the animation began and the length of the animation array that you gave it. And then it's going to check to see if another key is pressed then we need to transition to a different walking animation. For example, we might have to uh, transition to the link run down or link run up or link run right. If we let go of the key that we were holding down to keep this state, then we're just going to transition back to the idle state. We're going to state machine dot change state, new state idle with sprite. And we're going to take whatever animation we were just running, and we're going to go to the second frame of that, which is where Link is simply standing there. And so these are the two states that we give you for animation purposes. However, there are a number of other states that might be really useful. For example, you might want a state for when Link has died, and he spins around based on a timer before ending the game. You might want a state for Link being damaged. If Link takes damage, you're going to want to flash his sprite, um, you know, red and then back to the original color based on a timer. You also might want a state for weapon swinging. If you have a sword or a bow, then you need Link to um, change his sprite to reflect what he's doing, then you need a state for that. And a state for victory when he's raising the Triforce. Now keep in mind, these are all just for animation, but this uh, state kind of architecture can be really useful. For example, if you want to change the movement behavior of Link, you might have some additional states, such as Link Normal Movement. Whenever Link is in the Link Normal Movement state, he moves around normally, all is well, the arrow keys are all very responsive, and it's great. However, there might be a there might be a link stun state, where you simply take away the arrow key controls and put a timer on it. It's a state that will run for a certain amount of time and then switch back to a normal movement state, such as link normal movement. So hopefully this architecture will be useful to you. I've made use of it in a lot of my game jams, and it's done me well. It's fairly efficient once you get used to it, and it can be altered, it can be edited, uh, and it gives you some very granular control that the built-in Unity animation system can be a little finicky with giving you. So once you've got that going, the results should be pretty pretty. It's really starting to look a little bit more like The Legend of Zelda now. One of the final things we should do for the game is implement a simple sword, and I've actually gone ahead and done that. Hitting the Z key will create a sword uh, that is rotated and positioned offset of Link depending on which direction Link is facing. To create a sword is simple enough. You would go to Link Sprites, see that a sword is available to you, then you have to find it. Sit in here. 
There we go. Once you've found the sprite, you can simply drag it into the hierarchy, find it, rename it, and then make it a prefab by dragging it into your asset folder here. Next, we need to make some changes to our state machine. We're going to need a few more states. We're going to need a state for simple link movement, you know, normal link movement, where you can walk around with the arrow keys and you can trigger the appearance of the sword by hitting the Z key. Very simple state. Check it out. All it needs to do is store a reference to the player controller. And then in the on update function, it is going to grab your input and it will alter your velocity based on that. It will then decide which direction you are. Now you'll notice something new here. Uh, the player controller has a current direction field, which is a new field that we created. It's an enumeration. Essentially, we created a new enum that was based on direction, north, east, south, and west. We also created a new enum that is basically an entity state, either an entity is you know, normal, it's just standing there, or it's attacking. And we've created two fields to hold um, that state for our player. So you've got current state, which controls uh, whether the entity is uh, attacking or not. And you've got current direction, uh, which tells us which direction Link is facing. We also have an object or a, a public member called selected weapon prefab, a public game object. This is where we will link up the prefab, the wooden sword prefab, with Link. So if you look at Link, and you go down to the player controller script, you will see those new fields. So Link's starting state is normal, rather than attacking. His starting direction is south, rather than all the others. And you've got the link right here to the wooden sword prefab. So going back to the state machine, you can see that the last thing it does is it allows you, when Link is new, uh, moving and controlling normally, when you hit the Z key, it allows you to change the state uh, of Link uh, to a new state Link attack uh, with this particular weapon. So the Link attack state takes just a couple things. It takes a reference to the player controller. It takes a weapon prefab, which would be the wooden sword that we put on the player controller, and it takes a cooldown. The cooldown is basically how long Link holds the weapon out before retracting it and moving back to his normal movement state. The reason we need a normal movement state and an attacking state is because Link should not be able to move while he's attacking. So if you look at the state uh, Link attack, you can see that when it starts, it uh, stores some state on the player controller that says that, hey, this Link is attacking. It is no longer just moving about normally. It sets the velocity to zero because Link cannot be moving while he's attacking. It instantiates a new instance of the weapon prefab. Remember, we give the uh, weapon prefab to the Link attack state so Link could be attacking with the wooden sword. We could create a new prefab that was a bow. We could create a new prefab that was the magic sword or something else. Um, so we instantiate that instance and now we have to decide, okay, how are we going to rotate it and how are we going to offset that object from Link so that it looks nice. Basically, we check whether the player controller's current direction is north, east, south, or west, and we alter the direction offset vector uh, and the Euler angle, Euler angle vector as well. Um, after we figured out what those are two are going to be based on which direction Link is looking, uh, we are going to uh, position the weapon and we're going to rotate it so that it looks really nice. In our on update function for Link's um, uh, the link attack state, we're just going to decrease from that cooldown that was passed in. And if the cooldown gets less than or zero, uh, equal to zero, we conclude the state, which causes the public uh, void on finish function to be called, because the state finished, uh, where we simply set the player controller's state back to normal, and we um, 
destroy the weapon in instance. Basically, that makes it look like Link retracted his sword, for instance. So now you have a way of making that sword appear and disappear. There are a few little animation oddities, um, which will be addressed in the future, but they're not particularly important. The main importance is the mechanics, not the animations. There are a few changes to player control, just to recap. You have a few more public members to hold the selected weapon, and the current uh, state, current attacking state, and the current direction. Uh, you are now, since you have state for movement, you don't need to have the movement code in the update function of the player controller. You can now just update the new control state machine, uh, which we create up here. And we store right up here. So we have a state machine for animation and a state machine for just controlling Link and moving him about. Um, it might make sense to combine the two. It might give you a little bit more control over how Link looks. Uh, but how Link looks is not too important right now. You'll notice that we update both of these state machines. However, if the uh, control state machine is finished, it's not running any state at all currently, then we want to immediately change the control state machine's state to the standard movement. Uh, the effect of this is that if Link uh, finishes swinging his sword or being stunned from damage, then there will be no state in that state machine. It will immediately default back to just moving Link around normally, allowing you to keyboard control him. Uh, this is basically setting a default for the um, state machine. And yeah, that is about it. Uh, there will be two versions of this tutorial posted. Uh, one that uses the animator uh, for most of the animations, and one that uses this state machine architecture. Uh, the state machine architecture is a little bit heavy-handed as it comes to animations, um, but it is certainly useful when it comes to controlling state and uh, implementing different discrete behaviors of your characters, your enemies, bosses, and um, cutscenes and stuff like that. So you'll need to decide which one you want to watch and which one you want to take code from, and you will uh, actually behooves you to watch both if you have the time. So that is it. Uh, mind you, the sword as it is won't actually attack or hurt anything. However, you can do collisions on the sword in the same way that you do collisions with Link and the Rupee. So think about how you did that, and think about how you would detect a sword colliding with an enemy, and how you would indicate damage on that enemy. And with that, I wish you good luck. There's a spec in the assets folder of this project. Uh, be sure to give it a look, and look at the burn down chart to uh, discover uh, what is going to be critical for this project uh, in order to score a solid grade. Good luck, guys. Hope you have fun.